Well, hi, everybody. Glad you could join us today. My name is Greg Olson. I'm the director of the New York State Office for the Aging. We really have a great program today, one that can literally save your life or that of a loved one. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank uh, Kelly Matija and Alex Hyatt for my communications <clears throat> team who do all the behind the scenes work to make this a reality. So thank them. Um, this week is Sepsis Survivors Week, and it's a really important week. What we need to be doing and why we're having this program is to educate people on what sepsis is, what the signs and symptoms are, and what you need to do if you think that you um, have any of those signs and symptoms and think you might have sepsis yourself. I will introduce this amazing panel that I have today in a minute, but I wanna provide a little bit of context for you before we begin. Older adults, and we're counting those as individuals over the age of 60, have more than 13 times the risk of developing sepsis compared to younger individuals. Increased risk of sepsis among older adults is thought to stem from heightened infection risk and other predisposing conditions associated with the aging process. The following conditions are thought to underlie this heightened risk and why this is important for an organization like ours, the Office for the Aging, because these are individuals that we deal with every single day in the community uh, through our caseloads and many of the programs and services that, that we provide. So being institutionalized, like in a hospital or a nursing home, long-term care facility, uh, malnutrition, frailty and increased uh, ADLs, those are activities of daily living, functional limitations, cognitive impairment and dementia, comorbidities, including COPD, congestive heart failure, diabetes, cancer, chronic liver failure, things of that nature. And again, these are individuals that we see every single day in, in the homes and communities through the service infrastructure that we provide across New York State. Sepsis and the outcomes of sepsis are really devastating. And I, I'm particularly pleased that we have Jillian and Katie here with us today. We're gonna to tell us a little bit about their stories uh, um, being that it is uh, Sepsis Survivors Week. But again, why would we be involved? Because 80% of all sepsis cases occur in the community. Now, while this is a medical issue and a clinical issue, that's not where folks get sepsis. And it's really incumbent upon individuals like myself, uh, the two guests that we have in addition to uh, Jillian and Katie, but our entire networks to really understand what this is, how to identify it, um, and make this as common as many of the other things uh, that, that we work on, like stroke and things of that nature. So I couldn't be more pleased to introduce these four guests, and I will introduce them in the order that I have them. Um, Al Cardillo is one of our returning guests. Uh, I call him the golden voice. Um, <laughs> We do a lot of work together. He's a longtime friend and colleague. So Al has worked in the health field for over 35 years with positions in both the public and private sectors, including roles in health services development, administration, legislation, budget, provider association, and other. He is currently the executive uh, vice president of the Home Care Association of New York State. Uh, Tom Heyman. I was recently introduced to, and uh, as I've gotten in more involved, thanks to Al and the sepsis work, he has been part of the Sepsis Alliance since 2007, serving as president and CEO since 2013. Tom has led Sepsis Alliance to consecutive years of growth, including the organization's drive to increase sepsis awareness and the expansion of sepsis.org, and that should be in the chat box on the side, you should visit that a site serving more than 2.5 million patients, family members, caregivers, and medical professionals each year. Tom also led the organization's efforts to launch the Sepsis Alliance Clinical Community and the Sepsis Alliance Institute, which have trained more than 40,000 health professionals and Sepsis Alliance Voices, a new platform for national and state advocacy. So those are our two professionals, but I can't thank uh, both Katie and Jillian enough for being here and sharing their stories. This is Sepsis Survivors Week, and we have with us today two sepsis survivors. So let me introduce them, and thank you again for taking the time to be with us today. Katie Granger is a recent sepsis survivor with a personal passion for spreading sepsis education and awareness. In September 2018, she became ill with what she thought was just the flu, but two days later was admitted directly into the ICU in septic shock. Fortunately, her physician suspected sepsis and began a protocol that saved her life. Katie now lives life in a bilateral below knee amputee who also lost seven fingertips. 
She shares her story as a national speaker at corporations such as Microsoft and medical symposiums related to sepsis. She founded Sepsis Walks in Washington and Hawaii and is founding an inaugural stand-up paddle for Sepsis Alliance in Seattle in the summer of 2020. So Katie, thank you and, and uh, welcome. And Jillian Thil Thilba, and I, I, I'm sure I, I butchered that uh, and I apologize. She's a survivor who has won many battles against sepsis. Her experience with sepsis began due to an infection of a central venous access point to treat gastroparesis. Since, uh, since has, uh, she's experienced sepsis so many times that she has become immune to some broad spectrum antibiotics, Jillian shares her story broadly to help educate others about the dangers and the signs of sepsis. Jillian's also from New York, so thank you, Jillian, also for being with us. So I must have said the word sepsis 50 times, and if you're like me, uh, many of you are, and I, I don't profess or be embarrassed about things that I don't know. It's the only way that we learn. Um, sepsis was a word that Al Cardillo brought to me and, and asked me to get involved a few years ago. And I got to be honest with you, I'd heard the word, but I really didn't know what it was. Uh, and once I found out what it was and the devastating impacts it has, not only on older adults, but everybody. And that's why this is really important. This is not just about older people. This is across the spectrum. Um, I had to get involved because we have an opportunity and a responsibility to do something about it, given 80% of the cases originate um, in the home and in the community. So, Tom, let me start with you. I said sepsis. I wasn't somebody that really knew what sepsis was. What is it? Yeah, thanks, Greg, and thank you for your work in this area. We really appreciate it. Um, many, many of us don't know what sepsis is. Many in the healthcare profession don't yet know what it is, yet it is extremely common. It affects nearly 2 million people each year in the United States, um, has a very high mortality rate, so pay attention. We really need to understand what this is. It's twice as common as stroke, twice as deadly as stroke, and so what is it? Uh, sepsis is your body's reaction to an infection. So think about that, any kind of infection, it could be bacterial, could be viral, like COVID-19. COVID-19 is a viral infection. Uh, it could be uh, fungal or it could be parasitic. Um, so think of spider bites and, and things like that, cellulitis. So uh, why does your body react this way? We don't completely know, but what happens is when, you're, when you get an infection, your body fights the infection with white, white, white blood cells. And for some reason with sepsis, it over responds to that and your body actually starts fighting itself. And what that causes is um, uh, inflammation, which can lead to organ failure, which can lead to amputations like with Katie and can lead to death. So I think a good and easy way to think about it has really been helpful for me. It's, it's think of it like a bee sting. When you get stung by a bee, it really hurts, right? But just for a moment, just for a short period of time, you only have trouble if that bee sting results in an anaphylactic reaction to that bee sting, right? So similarly with sepsis, it starts with an infection. So the best thing you can do is prevent infections in the first place, good hygiene, make sure you're up to date on all your vaccinations, et cetera. But if you do get an infection, make sure that, um, that you are you know, responding to it and understand that this could become uh, serious through the septic reaction to that infection. Yeah, so Tom, you said something um, interesting in that this is uh, two times more common than stroke. It's quite common, and I'm going to ask Al about that, at least uh, from New York's perspective. Why is this something that, you know, people really don't know about, whether it be from a community perspective and then all your work in the clinical community, you still have the same challenges. Like mm -hmm. this is so common and people are, are getting sepsis every couple of minutes every single day, you know, what's the deal? Why is this something that, um, it, you know, we don't know as much about? Well, one of the one of the problems is is that is that the the way it's uh, uh, addressed both in the medical community and even in the presses generally focuses on on the kind of infection, the condition that was the precursor to the sepsis, a urinary tract infection, a central line infection, um, a pneumonia, uh, flu, you know, things of that nature, um, uh, an old broken uh, knee replacement or hip replacement which can become infected. So the focus is, is, is very often uh, on those as the, as the pre precipitating uh, issues, but, but, but then not as often does it then go on to discuss this, this it was the result of sepsis. Look at Alex Smith, the football player. 
Um, he had that terrible injury. Most of us, when we heard the symptoms, we said to each other, he's probably septic. But I think it took probably a year, a year and a half for that word to emerge associated with that. Senator Peralta, who passed away from sepsis uh, in the New York State Senate, when, when that was reported, Greg, um, it was reported in the press as, a, as something that very rarely occurs. So again, so rather than focus really on the, I think the, the, the effective information for the public and even for medical professionals, it sort of gets deflected. CDC uh, reported in 2016 in a major report that of individuals that ended up in the hospital from sepsis, seven out of 10 had interacted with the medical system previously. And you read report after report of an individual that was sent home because it was the flu, suspected the flu, or it was a stomach bug, or some other type of an issue. Um, and, uh, and again, there are too many tragic cases that, that result from that. So I think one of, the, one of the imperatives is really, going back to what you've been doing, to use the word, to talk about it, and to really work to educate the public and the health community <clears throat> about sepsis, its prevalence, and then when there are signs and symptoms discovered, how should the healthcare system react and perform? Because there are multiple parts of the system, as we know, doctors, home health agencies, hospitals, EMS, to think about how does one ensure the proper choreography that there's an effective response for the individual. Right. And, and so, I mean, clearly there's a lot of work to do, which is why we wanted to feature all of you today. So, I mean, Tom, reading... Uh, your background, what you've been able to do, um, not only within your organization, but within the coalitions that have been built really across the country, um, I, I think is amazing. And it's, it's, uh, we need to continue that type of work. But tell us a little bit about what the National Sepsis Alliance is. Yeah, we, we are a national patient advocacy group. And like so many organizations like ours that are doing good works, uh, it, we, we were created out of a tragedy. And in our case, it was Dr. Carl Flatley who got that unfortunate call to, to do some good in, in the nation. Uh, Dr. Flatley was an oral surgeon in Tampa, Florida, uh, no longer practicing, but very involved in the work. Um, he had never heard the word sepsis, clearly had been involved in many infections, treating root canals and wisdom teeth and things like that, had never heard the word in all of his training. And um, it wasn't until his daughter, Erin, who's a, a completely healthy, young 23-year-old woman, just graduated college, was going to be a school teacher, went into their local hospital for a hemorrhoidectomy, uh, so-called routine outpatient surgery. She was sent home after the surgery, assuming everything had gone perfectly well. It had not. We found out later uh, her condition got worse, not better. And she had developed an infection as a result of that surgery. And um, there was no continuum of care, no antibiotics administered. And she ended up passing two days later. Perfect, from perfectly healthy to, to, to deceased. And that led Dr. Flatley on a mission to make sure no other family would experience that kind of pain or agony. And we've been fighting to, to do just that. And sepsis is, is a medical emergency like stroke or heart attack. It is not to be taken lightly. Uh, this, the common symptoms, uh, we have a mnemonic now, which I'm sure is shared in the, um, in, in the, in the library here. Uh, the common symptoms are uh, temperature, higher or low. And that's the T in the time mnemonic. I is signs of an infection, uh, painful urination, uh, open bleeds, uh, swelling. Um, M is for mental status change, very common indicator. Someone's just not right uh, is often an indicator that something you really need to pay attention if something's, someone's not themselves. And E is for extreme pain or discomfort or shortness of breath, which we know now with COVID-19 is a, a very common symptom. So there is an urgency around this. We're losing somebody every two minutes in this country. And we, we project that 80% of those people did not need to pass. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done. People need to really educate themselves about this uh, to protect themselves and their families. And we are hard at work for making sure that all healthcare providers know as much about this as they need to, as much as they do about stroke. And we're working to make, our, make sure our legislators um, are aware of the burden of disease. This is the most expensive cost of healthcare in hospitals in the country. One in three people who die in a hospital will die of sepsis. So this is a major healthcare crisis that not, has not been adequately addressed. Yeah, and we're with you on that. I think, you know, getting out the signs and symptoms to our case managers, our home delivered meal drivers, our senior center staff, anybody in the community, the partnerships that we have, 
um, <clears throat> equally important. And I appreciate the work uh, that you're doing. So Al, let's bring this down a little bit to New York State. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you three questions in one. And if you need me to remind you of any of them, I'm um, happy to do that. What's the impact of sepsis on, on New York State specifically? Mm -hmm. um, and then talk a little bit about you know, your leadership role at the Home Care Association and the task force and coalition that, you know, you've helped pull together and thank, thankfully have uh, invited us to join in. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Greg. So uh, uh, based on the Department of Health's uh, reporting to the Department of Health, about 50,000 individuals um, uh, are, uh, are incidents of sepsis uh, uh, each year. Uh, in terms of the specific impact with respect to the system, uh, you have um, uh, a sepsis is the number one cause of hospital readmissions really by far. Um, yeah, like one in four are readmitted every 30 days, something like 45% after 60 days. And I think it's close to 65% within a year. Um, because the risk is higher in terms of the in terms of the expense, to, you know, Tom referred to the expense at the national level. Um, uh, just on the Medicare side alone, uh, uh, CMS projected that it was 62 billion dollars in uh, 200, uh, 2019. Um, in New York State, just in home from home health alone, um, it's, it's somewhere between 200 and $500 million in terms of hospitalizations that result from, from sepsis. And of course, majority of them are preventable hospitalizations. So it's, it's, it's very extensive. And I think that one of the things that, and oh, on the Medicaid side within our state, it's really the number one of the, of the potentially avoidable Medicaid admissions that's been studied uh, at our state level. Uh, and uh, and, and that, that's for the broad uh, Medicaid population. So, you know, given, given the statistics that we were seeing, you know, now back around 2013, 2014, especially with regard to the community prevalence, we decided as an organization, we represent the home health sector. Uh, we represent folks that are in the community delivering community health. And uh, we said, you know, we need to find out what can we do? What role can we play in this? And so we brought together experts from not only New York, but around the country, uh, from Sepsis Alliance, from the Rory Staunton Foundation, from hospitals that had really uh, done this extensively and from our own field. And working together, we, we, uh, we set about to create a screening tool that could be used in, in home health agencies and in, in broadly in the field um, that would help detect the risk factors, signs and symptoms of early sepsis, as well as severe sepsis, and then, and then connect that to what's called an algorithm or a protocol for what does the clinician do with these kinds of findings and their relationship with the patient and the doctor. And so as a result, we, we created and then we, 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 did, we tested this screening tool, which I do have right here. I don't know if you can see it, but the screening tool that, uh, that we then ha have been working to train uh, and, and educate agencies to adopt and to utilize within the system. Uh, and so we, we, this tool is, is being used by agencies in almost every county of the state, not all agencies, but it, there's at least one or more agency in about 56 of the 62 counties that are utilizing this. And the, so the idea is, is that to screen every person on every clinical visit for any of these signs and symptoms. At the same time, it's to educate the patient and the family. And we also have this form here that was created by IPRO, which is a quality assurance organization who, who actually used the tool that we created in training over 10,000 individuals in um, in early sepsis recognition. So uh, that was something we put into place and actually we're the first state in the country that has done that following really New York's lead to put protocols in the hospitals. Um, in, in reference to what we're, what we're next doing, we continue to work to try to get providers to adopt this tool, but we've received a very generous grant from a from the a, a state foundation, the Cabrini Foundation, to uh, to take this to the next level. And one of the main focuses is on trying to coordinate the different parts of the system to be synchronized in sepsis response. So we have a a, a major steering committee. Greg, you are on it. Uh, Tom, Tom, you'll be on it. Jillian. Uh, so the idea is 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 to is to bring together all of the sectors to discuss 
what are what are the needs at the clinical level at the service level for information and synchronization so that when an individual is found with signs and symptoms they they're able to coordinate with EMS with a doctor with the emergency room and so on um, that's one big area another area is in pediatric sepsis so our the tool that we created was for adults um, but we are, we are we have a permission to try to create a tool for pediatrics and then also for special needs populations, uh, individuals, whether they are in the intellectual and developmental disability realm, in assisted living, maternal sepsis, things of that nature. So that's what we're doing next uh, in the area of sepsis. That's great, Al, and it's, it's amazing work. And again, I, we couldn't uh, be more appreciative of being involved in it. I think what you. You know, you're doing here in New York and what Tom and his colleagues are doing at the national level, I mean, clearly, you know, the, the context is so important. I appreciate both Katie and Jillian uh, giving us a little time just to set the context. So I'm gonna ask uh, Tom one more and then Al, and then I wanna move into the stars of the program. Um, but, you know, Tom, again, going back to the lens that, that I look at this out of, which is the community lens, how can caregivers and individuals uh, that are not part of a clinical environment, regular everyday people uh, like me, um, identify possible sepsis at home. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, at our website, sepsis.org, there are vast re free, all free resources to get better educated about sepsis. And again, it comes down to looking for those symptoms. And if you suspect that something is not right, it probably isn't. And um, we've heard too many stories of people putting off going to the doctor or the doctor couldn't see them until Wednesday. So they wait till Wednesday when really it, it called for a 911 call um, or a trip to the emergency department. You know, you, mothers trust their gut. You know, we have to trust our gut on this. If you are experiencing temperature high or low, any sign or indication of a possible infection, mental status change, we hear this again and again, you know, they just weren't right. They weren't making sense. And if there's extreme pain, we've often heard people say, it's the worst pain I've ever had. I felt like I was going to die. We hear that again and again and again. You know, don't try to tough it out. You know, we know you can't miss a day of work, but you know, you don't want to lose your life over that. So um, I think that's really, you know, make sure you're, you're practicing all the, all the good prevention uh, practices that we laid out. Um, look for those signs and symptoms. Make sure you're educated about them. Uh, we don't want you to be frightened, but we want you to be enlightened about this. It's very, very common and it advances very quickly. That's another thing why the mnemonic time is critically important. Sepsis, the mortality rate can go up as much as 8% for every hour that you delay treatment. So it's really critical for us as, as the general public to take it upon ourselves to get ourselves to medical care and to say, I'm concerned about sepsis because we know a lot of our healthcare providers are not adequately trained or ready. And that includes home care, first responders, nurses, doctors, pharmacists. We still have a lot of work to do. So don't, don't assume that the doctor or nurse knows exactly what's going on. They may not be thinking about sepsis. It, you know, We hear doctors say it was not on my radar. And um, if it's not on their radar, we need to make sure it's on their radar in defense of ourselves and our loved ones. Yeah, and I, I think that's an amazing point. And so for folks who are listening, you know, we, we will have all of those resources. If Kelly hasn't already put them in there, they will be in there. You know, we often see, um, you know, pieces that come out that, that are too busy, um, that may be pages and pages long, but the things that you have been able to be put out are on one pager, it's very easy to read. And to illustrate your point, when I had sent out the signs and symptoms to my entire agency, and I'll never forget this story. This wasn't all that long ago, on a Friday afternoon, um, saying that you know we were involved in this campaign. It's incumbent upon us to make sure we recognize this. On Monday, one of my staff emailed me back and said that sheet that you sent on Friday saved my life. I diagnosed that I had sepsis. My medical provider did not have it on the radar. Uh, wound up having sepsis and wound up being fine from it. But again, to your point, how, how important it is and how little time it takes to click on the Sepsis Alliance, see some of those protocols and tools, uh, easy to read sign and symptoms and uh, really to educate ourselves. So Al, how can the community get involved in New York State in fighting sepsis? Well, I, I, I would echo what, what Tom had said in terms of being you know very... Uh, Diligent uh, in 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 reaching out and and familiarizing accessing and familiarizing yourselves 
uh, with these resources. We extensively use the training materials from Sepsis Alliance in the ground level work that we did with home care nurses, with physicians, with health uh, uh, health insurance plans, EMS, uh, and others. I mean, certainly for anybody that is involved in the in the uh, in home care field, the in home care part of it, you can get in touch with with the, our association, and we will plug you into the initiative that we've we've created and, and expanded and continue to work to expand to more formally um, uh, 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 be assessing for and screening for and familiar with how to work with sepsis when it's identified in the community. So I think that that's really, a, a, I think that's really the key part. And also, um, I think the extent to which you can take important information on this subject and bring it into the public sphere. So there are many folks that are on this, uh, I'm sure on this uh, webinar that that are, you know, that work, uh, your case managers, uh, individuals who work with uh, work with populations. It's important to reach out to sources who would who would be able to further relay information about it. So, for example, there have been a number of times that that I've had the opportunity to be on WGY radio here in this area, uh, interviewed by Diane Donato, you know, uh, who's dedicated entire programs to this, you know, uh, and 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 the same thing with um, with a health beat program um, in this area. You know the, the television program, and and I think that that those kinds of opportunities are really important uh, to uh, help spread awareness about what this is. Or articles in the paper. If you're a survivor, or you know someone who's a survivor. I was recently contacted by someone from the university who uh, who had read an interview from a couple of years ago and connected with me and said, "My sister died of sepsis when she was 42. What can I do to help?" So I think all of those, uh, Greg, uh, would be very very important elements to to work with. But definitely yeah, that, reach out to us as the association. Yep. So that's the Home Care Association in New York. And you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, when we, uh, um, you know, in the beginning of our partnership, Al, we put together a seven point plan with you. And one of the major aspects was doing a 12 month a year educational campaign, training the case managers, getting the signs and symptoms out. We have a large caregiver program, but we touch 1.3 million people a year. And it's just one of those things, the drumbeat has to continue, it has to be loud. So uh, Katie and Jillian, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, I thought it was important to get some of the facts and figures, really show how serious this is. And um, can't thank the two of you enough for um, being willing to be on today to share your story. So Kelly, can you cue up uh, the, the video, please? missing sound all right so kelly we don't have sound why don't we pause this and we'll put it in the oh that's a boat <laughs> the malibu i know that boat we will add that link so that that's katie's story so um we'll add that video to the chat so people can check it out but what katie why don't we start with you and tell thank us you. tell us your story uh, first of all thank you for having me here and thank you for having this incredible program, spreading awareness. Um, two and a half years ago, I went into septic shock and nearly lost my life. I was living in Hawaii at the time, and I had just returned from a trip on the mainland, um, visiting my children. They're older. One was a junior in college, and one was um, had recently graduated. And I had just gone down and seen my daughter's dorm room for the year and, and just kind of helped her get situated. Came home to... Um, an empty house because my husband was on a fishing trip in Wyoming, taking advantage of the fact that I was also traveling. So I had a few days by myself and I got off the airplane and I noticed that on my thumb, on my right thumb, I just had a small, um, about the size of a pencil eraser, I had a small little bump, but it was purple in color and it was oozing fluid. And I've never seen anything like that on my body before. So I knew I was alone. I have heard of sepsis um, at this point in my life. We actually have a friend that lost her leg to sepsis. So it was slightly on my radar, but I didn't know the signs and symptoms, which you'll, will be apparent in my story. So I, um, I went to an emergency clinic. I checked out fine. They looked at it, said it does look like it might be staph. They gave me antibiotics. All of my vital signs were strong. They did nothing wrong. They sent me home. I was perfectly fine at that point because my body had not yet begun the septic reaction. So I got home, um, called my husband, told him I was 
not feeling great, but that um, that I'd check in in the morning. So in the morning, I made my first mistake. Um, Tom mentioned that time information. Um, it, the reason that we use time is because we've made the words work for us because it's a matter of time. The sooner you can get to the hospital, the better. Had I noticed earlier and gotten to the hospital and had it been caught, I would not be sitting here today as a multiple amputee. So um, I went to the clinic, went home, called my husband the next morning and said, hey, I'm fine. I don't have a fever. That was my first mistake. I did not know. And I think it's really important that people understand that Temperature is not always a gauge of how sick you are. When you get very, very sick, your temperature actually can start dropping. And I don't understand all of that very well, so I won't get into it too much, but it can happen. So um, continue your um, research. If you think that you might be sick and, and you don't have a fever, if you still feel sick, keep looking and trying to figure out what's going on. So I was very sleepy, which was a sign of mental decline. It's one of the earliest signs of it. But um, I didn't have anyone with me and I had just been traveling. So I wrote it off and thought, well, I'm just tired because I've been traveling. So I slept all day and thought really nothing of it. Midday, I sent my husband a text saying that I had thrown up, but I thought it was just because I had taken an antibiotic on an empty stomach. So here I have flu-like symptoms, which are not uncommon when, when an infection is becoming systemic, and I wrote it off. I just said it, it, might, it might be nothing. Um, I mentioned that you know the mental decline was probably happening. Um, sepsis is an inflammatory response within your body, and so that was already beginning to happen clearly on this Saturday, but I was missing the signs. Um, so I kind of slept all that day. I wasn't feeling great. I think by the afternoon, I started imagining that I probably just had the flu and um, I just slept through the night. Um, first thing in the morning, I woke up and to be clear, I don't really have a lot of memories from this weekend. So um, we put together a lot of it through texts that I had sent people saying, I don't have a fever, I'm fine. You know, I, I sent, these were all texts that I had sent to people. And um, so I woke up in the morning and I do remember this part. I remember sitting up in bed and thinking, I have to, I have to get out of here, I need help. And, and I didn't even really understand why necessarily. I don't remember understanding why, but I did text a friend and I said, please come and get me and take me to the hospital. I have never been so sick. And that's one of the final signs of sepsis is the um, extremely ill. And it can be in the form of someone saying, you know, I've never been so sick or I feel like I'm going to die is another common one. I don't think I'm that dramatic. So I wouldn't have texted that to somebody, but I have a feeling I felt like I was gonna die because I was pretty insistent that she take me to the hospital. So she came down and got me. She took me to the hospital, which was an hour away. Um, I will just make note that I should have called an ambulance and I didn't, which is also very common. We we often think we're not sick enough. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't identify how sick I was. And so I just had her drive me, um, which was ended up being fine. But um, on the way to the hospital, my hands and feet started burning. I was crying in the back seat, and I told her that this was happening. She was extremely alarmed as we had never heard of such a symptom before. And so she called the hospital and said, I'm coming in hot. I've got someone in the back who can't sit up because she keeps trying to pass out on me because she's so low blood pressure. We, we discovered. And um, anyways, they met us at the emergency room, took me straight into the ICU. My blood pressure was 50 over 30, which is very, 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 very low. Um, I was clearly in shock because of something. And I believe that they immediately identified that it could be sepsis. Um, this was on the island of Kauai, which is a small island um, in a small state. But they already, I believe, had an emergency a, a protocol for sepsis because I've seen my chart and I've seen that when they when they listed my blood pressure was in bright red letters. When they listed my breathing rate, which was below um, was above 20 breaths per minute, which is kind of a danger zone, that that was in red. And anything that was out of the ordinary was in red. So um, they immediately began, let's see, they would have drawn blood to test it to see what the pathogen was in my body. They never did figure out the pathogen, which is common in about 50% of sepsis cases. So even though I had this bump on my finger, with the reaction my body was having, they suspected that there could be something else going on. So they tried to, they, they checked, I did, they did internal exams on me. They did scopes and machines and I, they looked at everything. They found that my um, kidneys were failing. Um, I stopped urinating in the hospital. I was having difficulty breathing, so I had oxygen. By the end of the day, I was in a pressurized oxygen mask that was pushing air into my lungs for me because I was having such difficulty. My oxygen levels in my blood were very low. And um, we were in the process at that time of, of my family on the mainland had been contacted. They hadn't reached my husband yet, but they were able to reach him and he'll eventually come into the story. Um, but they, um, 
they, at, by the evening of that first day on Saturday, my hands started turning purple and it was happening in kind of the center area here. And you can see that I ended up losing fingertips, but it, it was a really unusual it, formation of, of discoloration. And um, I was diagnosed with a condition called DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is blood clots out in my extremities. And it doesn't happen to everybody who gets sepsis, but I was unfortunate that it did happen to me. So they were in the process of trying to transfer me over to Oahu, which is Honolulu, for those who, you know, you've heard of Hawaii. Um, that's the major city there. There is a level one trauma center, and my family was insisting that I go there. Um, I did, I do have a doctor in the family who was researching it all in the background and said, if she's got DIC, we want her to get, um, we want her to go where she'll have the best chance of saving her limbs because my, this doctor realized that I might lose my limbs. And um, I fortunately did not realize that. I'm happy to say that I was a little bit ignorant as to what was going on. I didn't know the extent of it, but, but I was not the main person they were talking to. It was my family. Um, and probably because I was showing a little bit of signs of mental decline at that point, I was a little confusion and such. Um, anyways, I went over to Oahu um, to Queens Medical Center, which is the level one trauma center. And the things that they have there that I was treated with the next few weeks, first of all, they had a really um, incredible ICU unit. I went there for a week. I was um, intubated for the flight over to Oahu and I was um, um, kept under until my lungs got stronger. And thank God they did. Um, they did warn my family that I may lose my life. So my children came over and um, then they prepared them that I would very possibly lose my hands and feet. So my family had been prepared for that um, upon the insistence of my husband who begged them to please let them know what they should be prepared for just in case. And um, fortunately, um, five days later, I did come out of it. It was the following Saturday. Um, and um, I spent a week with ICU delirium, which I just want to mention, especially for an aging uh, group that may end up in the ICU at some time or another. This was not from the May sepsis, it was from the ICU time and it was from the medications that they give me and being out for a week and maybe hearing things that were going on in the room. But I had uh, severe confusion and, um, and was hallucinating. I was imagining that my dreams were real and really honestly, every nightmare I could think of was happening. When I woke up, I thought someone in my family had taken their life. And um, it took me all day to figure out that that hadn't happened. But on top of everything that I was experiencing, I was worried about this thing that wasn't even real. And it was really hard for my family all week to manage the hallucinations I was having because I thought a lot of bad things were happening. And um, anyways, after um, a week after being in that hospital, I became coherent again. And I was at that point already undergoing daily hyperbaric chamber treatments so that I could get oxygen to my extremities. And I was doing, um, they were doing, um, nitroglycerin treatments on my hands and feet. So finally, after three weeks, they were able to save my hands. As I mentioned, when I woke up, the parts of my fingers that are missing, which are these fingers here, um, were black and they, they looked like charcoal. They were dry and black. I had gangrene and they were clearly dead. And that's all that I ended up losing is that initial part. Um, we were not able to save my feet. And um, when I was finally ready to admit that my family stopped the hyperbaric treatments and we started making arrangements to um, fly me to Seattle. And I ended up having my amputations in Seattle um, at a amazing clinic there, Harborview Medical Center. And I had a um, specialist take off my legs in one surgery. And then a month later, I had my fingertips removed. And that was by my choice. They were willing to do it all at once, but it was just too much. I couldn't, I couldn't handle. Um, and then I, I, I continued my recovery at home through the help of their um, rehab program, which is very extensive for this type of trauma. So I had a doctor that managed my, all of my care. I saw occupational therapists for my hands, physical therapists and occupational therapists to help me adjust to wheelchairs and then walkers and then walking and prosthetics. And it was two months before I got my first prosthetic legs. And um, it was a very slow process of learning to walk, but I, I now walk, I, oftentimes people say that they don't even notice. And I wear shorts a lot, but my legs are flesh toned. And um, so a lot of people notice that I have a white band around my knee, which is the, the sleeve that I wear with my legs. And they assume that something happened to my knees. And so when I tell them I'm an amputee, they're surprised. So I've done amazingly well at recovering. Wow. I mean, Katie, that's just, uh, it's a horrific story for you and your family. And I very much appreciate, <coughs> excuse me, um, you sharing that uh, with us. I think you mentioned a couple of things that, you know, really important and maybe after we can dive into a little bit more, which is time, right? You went from visiting a dorm room to seeing a bump on your thumb to 
you know, in a week having all of that happen. And it's just, it's unbelievable. And I think that one of the main things you kept saying, and this is kind of what I want to follow up on after uh, we talked to both of you about your stories is we do live in a culture where we are never sick enough. You're not going to go immediately to, you know, if I have a fever or, you know, it might be the flu or it could be this or it could be that. And how do we get people um, to try to get the intervention that's needed earlier so you don't wind up, right? You didn't do anything wrong. It just, that's kind of how we're all designed. I'm not that sick or et cetera. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that. I'll have a follow-up a question thank um, you. for you, but thank you. Um, Jillian, um, not only have you had sepsis, you've had it multiple times. Um, tell us your story. Okay, so a little background. I have gastroparesis. I was diagnosed about 10 years ago. Um, basically, my stomach is paralyzed and I have dysmotility throughout my entire GI tract. Um, so I, I don't have any, I can't, any anything I eat, I almost immediately throw up. So um, the only means for nutrition that I have is through a central line. Um, it's called the Hickman. Um, it's placed on the chest wall and it threads through your jugular to your heart. Um, so, you know, being that it's a direct, it's direct access to your bloodstream, it's, um, you know, very easy to get infections and which in, in turn ca cause sepsis. Um, and I'm also on TPN, which is a big bag. Of, it's nutrition, uh, liquid nutrition that goes through the, the uh, bloodstream, but it's very sugary and the substance in it is just, it, it's a, it makes a perfect breeding ground for, um, for bacteria. So it's, you know, it's imperative that um, sterile procedures, you know, taken when, when accessing and when using the line. Um, my personal opinion, I feel like I have an advantage over Katie per se, because I, um, you know, I, I already know that I have this and I, and I'm, people have told me and warned me, doctors, you know, um, easy, it's easy to get infections and just be aware. So, um, you know, I, I have an advantage knowing that as opposed to Katie. Um, so my first uh, experience was um, in 2012, the summer of 2012. And um, it was right around the beginning of my diagnosis. So I wasn't, I wasn't really um, sure on much of, you know, what was going on because it was new. Um, so my symptoms started out with, you know, I was just super achy. Um, my joints were, were hurting. My back was hurting. I had extreme bone pain. Um, and then moments of confusion, the mental decline. It's interesting that you say that because everybody around me, um, before I become symptomatic myself, I'll show those symptoms that people, people can, um, can see like my family and they, they almost explain it as like, I'm intoxicated almost like I have a glazed over, um, glazed over eyes. And I just, like you said, don't make sense. Um, and I'm just, it's, I'm confused. Most of that time, I don't, I don't, um, remember it. It's all just my family that, that sees it before I do. Um, so yeah, so I had the, you know, the confusion and the, the backache and everything, um, start getting a really bad headache. Um, and then the next, and then a couple of days later, I woke up in the middle of the night and, um, I had really awful chills and I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but the Riger chills is very um, prominent when it comes to sepsis. And it's, it's, it's so exhausting and it's unlike um, your typical cold and flu chills. It's just, it's uncontrollable shaking. And um, you know, there's no amount of blankets that suffice how cold, how cold you are. Um, and it's just super exhausting. The only way I can really explain it is, you know, if, if one were to tense their muscles for, um, all their muscles for about an hour, um, it's just extremely exhausting. Um, around that time, I take, I take my temperature, it's about a 99.2, which is, you know, considered a low grade fever. However, my normal, my normal temperature is usually lower. So um, I have to kind of worry about if, you know, 99.2 might be a low grade fever for somebody, but it, you know, it's, it's a little different for me because I start out low. So it's something that I have to, I have to keep in the back of my mind. Um, 
So um, I took, and I, I continue to take my temperature like every 30 minutes or so. Um, and it, every, every 30 minutes, it usually goes up about um, a degree, like it goes up a whole degree and it's super fast, super fast. Um, so this next time I, I checked, it was at 101 and 101 is kind of like the checkpoint for, you know, for going, going into, when you have a central line, the, the doctors make it, you know, they, they let you know that 101 is kind of like the baseline. That's the checkpoint. You need to go to the emergency department because something's, something's up. So, um, I reached 101 and, um, I'm getting ready to go and, uh, you know, I, I can't, I can't walk further than three feet without being gassed and out of breath. Um, I need, I need someone to hold on to because um, I often, you know, I feel like I'm gonna pass out. I, my eyes go black and my ears have like a fuzzy ringing um, in it. So um, I need help to, to get in the car to go there. Um, and then during, during the trips, usually, like we talk about how it's ex extremely painful and it like, that's just, it's an understatement. It's incredibly, incredibly painful. And you know, the ride, the ride there, I remember is, was just, you know, it was awful and um, excruciating. Um, when you, when I arrived at the, de at the emergency department, um, they could all tell I was extremely pale and um, dry mouth, dry lips. Um, they take my, vit my vital signs and, um, my blood pressure was 93 over seven over 37. Um, my heart rate was 142, and my temperature increased to 103. So these are all telling signs that I'm I'm septic, essentially. So I usually go back right away. They usually don't they don't put me back in the waiting room. They um, and it, in this instance they brought me back right away. Um, the doctor, you know, they they come in and they they ask you questions, and I was just in incredible amounts of pain and um, just, yeah. So I, I wasn't able to really um, express, like I wasn't able to answer them. So um, luckily I had family there that was able to answer, but um, yeah, so I, I wasn't, I wasn't really coherent enough to really answer questions. Um, they hooked me up to monitors and um, to monitor my blood pressure, my pulse. Um, and then they, they try to start an IV and I'm already a heart sick as it is. And then you add dehydration from sepsis and it's almost impossible to get an IV in. So, um, you know, they, they attempt this instance, it was, you know, they five times to no avail. And um, so then they put a, a um, IV in my, in my neck and it's called a central venous line, um, which then they could get blood work from, and they take cultures from the line. They take cultures from the line, they take cultures peripherally, and they also just take blood work. Um, the cultures will show you if, if there's any bugs growing, um, you know, so you can go on from there. Um, then they bolus a bunch, like a, a bunch of fluids because obviously to try to get your, um, your blood pressure back up. Um, so, and then they also give you Tylenol to try, they gave me Tylenol to try to, to break the fever. Um, and then they usually start, they start, they started me on broad spectrum antibiotics just to, you know, baseline, just get your, get your antibiotics in. Um, during this time, my blood pressure continued to drop, um, about 80 over 30. And at that time they said, it's time to go to the, they sent me to the ICU to be closely monitored. Um, while in the ICU, my temperature was about 103.6, um, and they decided to um, like cover me in, in ice packs. And that's, it's terrible when, you're, when you have the chills and stuff and they're putting ice packs in your armpits and in, in between your legs and stuff. Um, so um, at that point, my blood, my blood work came back. Um, my white blood cell count was high, um, and which, which means that there's um, infection present. Um, and it also showed kidney failure. So I was also in kidney failure. Um, then the blood cultures came back. Uh, it usually takes 48 to 72 hours to get results. It can, it can take that long. Mine grew in like 10, 10 hours. Um, and I grew a gram negative MSSA stat. It's a very sticky drug. It's a very sticky um, bug. So um, they, they always have concern of the heart because it can travel to the heart and just it sticks onto the heart. So they, you, I have a bunch of, um, 
you know, heart tests, echocardiograms and such. Um, infectious disease then um, figure with, with the bug that came, they can pick a um, specific antibiotic to use um, to, to fight the bug. After, after that, it was, I mean, I wasn't really, I don't even know how to explain it. Um, like the, I've, I've never gotten like Katie, Katie bad, but um, I, um, the, the antibiotics always usually work, but as of, I mean, what you said recently, the um, antibiotics I'm becoming resistant to. So um, this was at the beginning, so everything was, was fine then. But, you know, as with all the infections that I've had now, um, it's extremely hard to find an antibiotic that will work. Um, so they also, they take out, they have to remove the line because obviously that's the source of infection. So it's very, it, you know, I feel for other people who have infection that's inside the body and such, um, this is very, it's very easy to just, you know, if, it, if the infection is, is coming from this, then it's very easy to just, um, you know, pull it out and then um, continue the course of antibiotics. And you usually have to wait until um, you have a positive or a, a negative blood culture to get a to get a central line back in. So um, I, you know, I did the I did the course in the hospital of the antibiotics until I um, was negative with the blood cultures. Put the line back in, and then um, since I do have a line, they they can discharge me when I'm obviously when I'm stable enough, um, and then I can go home on a on the six week IV antibiotic treatment. Um, and I could do it myself at home because I have, I have the central line to do it. So, I mean, mine's not as dramatic as Katie, but um, again, it's, it's um, something that I do with all the time because um, I always have to worry about with the, the TPN and whatnot, um, how it affects my body. And it's like I said, it's almost impossible to not get infections with TPN because it is just basically food for bacteria and it creates like the perfect storm for for um, infection, which leading and leading to sepsis. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of like status quo for all of them. But now it's like I I am so knowledgeable and educated with my own body that I I know when I need to go in. And when you guys say time, it's it's so it's so true because time is of the essence and it, it happens so fast. So when I start getting those those first symptoms, um, I make sure I'm, I'm on my way to the emergency, emergency room to, to get it treated. Oh, and, and thanks Jillian for sharing your story also. And it, you know, it is traumatic. Um, it's different, I think, than Katie's experience, but, yeah. you know, I'd like to ask both of you guys, because <clears throat> I think what you described was your first experience, but now you kind of know what to look for. And you, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking is pretty easy to do. But if you were reflecting, both of you, on your first times as we were having the conversation earlier about, you know, I don't think that I'm that sick or this could be something else, what would each of you have done differently? Because there's going to be, there's people who are going to watch this or who are watching this now. I'm never going to get sepsis. That's not for me. But I think what Tom and Al said, no, one person uh, gets this every two minutes. It could be any of us for different reasons. Jillian's is different than yours, Katie, and, and it can be different. So that's, the facts are, are not there. This could happen to anybody, anytime, anywhere, any place. So Monday morning quarterbacking, what would you have done different in your first go round? Um, do you think, what was the a particular sign or symptom that you wished, um, again, you didn't do anything wrong. I'm, I'm trying to articulate this the correct way to get people to take it seriously and at least inquire that I might have, you know, sepsis. Is that for both of us? Why don't I, do you mind if I start, Jillian? Absolutely. Um, I, I touched on it. Um, first of all, I never knew you could be sick without a fever. I mean, that was just news to me. And I feel like, gosh, I, I raised two kids and I've been a mom and it's like, you know, moms joke that we're like, play doctor half the time because our kids are sick all the time. And I had no idea you could be sick without a fever. So that's one thing I would let people know is don't stop looking for the source of your illness just because you don't have a fever. Um, and then also um, 
so I would have, I would have called for help much sooner um, because I was, I, and I, I would have had someone check on me because I was alone. I would have had a friend physically come. I had friends call me because they knew I was sick and offer to bring me lunch. And I said, oh no, I have food in the fridge. And so I would encourage people when you're sick, let people check on you and encourage people to check on you. Um, and I had actually encouraged them the night before. I said, I, I called a friend and said, I'm home alone. I'm not feeling great. I'm an on antibiotics. We check on me in the morning. And um, I texted her and said, I don't have a fever. I'm fine. And then she didn't check on me again, which I don't blame her. I told her not to, but I wish she had because she probably would have found me very lethargic. She might've noticed that I wasn't making sense or I seemed drunk or something like that. She might've caught that. And then I guess um, if you think you have the flu, really look for those signs of, um, of mental decline. And then um, in time, the last one is extremely ill. You, um, we touched on this at the end of what I said before, but um, uh, you know, being at home, we, we need to be our own advocates. And so I think with um, COVID-19 has given us this opportunity to understand that there are things that we need to look for that we haven't taken as seriously, like shortness of breath. Um, Jillian mentioned that she couldn't even barely stand up, you know, and, and she was having difficulty breathing and difficulty, you know, even walking. Those are, those are signs that you need help. If you have shortness of breath, that's definitely one of the signs of COVID-19, but that same infection can cause sepsis. And um, so that's something to look out for. And okay. also you can do it, you can do it with yourself, but b being a parent of college age kids and knowing someone who lost her leg in college, my family has had a, a, a deal that no one is sick alone, you know? And so I, that's what I was operating on that deal that I made with them. It was generally them that were alone. I'd never been alone before and been sick, but I did make the effort to call somebody, but then I backed off on it. And so be firm. Don't let it, don't let your kids be sick alone. Tell them to check on their friends every couple hours. And their friends should check on them every couple hours when they're sick. It's just, it's a buddy system. And I think you need to utilize it. Yeah, I really like that, actually. Um, that's, uh, that's good advice. Jillian, what, what, what would you say? Um, I, I think it's super imperative that, um, you know, the people that you live with, who are your, you're around a lot, um, be educated in the signs and symptoms. Because, you know, it's, I, for me personally, I owe a lot to, um, you know, my boyfriend who notices it way before I do, you know, with my confusion and not making sense and um, dizziness and running into things. And um, you can kind of nip it in the bud and, and, and catch it before it becomes too serious. Um, also, I, I do believe that, you know, if, if nobody thinks if you get a bee sting that it's going to turn into sepsis or, you know, organ failure and whatnot. But I think it's realistic to, to have that in mind, have that in the back of your mind, but don't you need to, you need to be realistic about it. Like it's, it's on the table, but don't, you know, don't go from one to 10 about it, you know, just, just keep it in the back of your mind and, you know, deal with things as in, in steps and baby steps. And it, you know, just know that it, that can definitely be, um, you know, something that happens is the sepsis, but. Yeah. I, and uh, again, I, I, I thank you both. I think this is really important. Um, two completely different stories. Um, and just how important this issue is, how, uh, how often it happens and what we need to do. And I know that again, through the work of Tom and, and Al trying to not only get all the clinical providers up to speed and we have work to do there, but certainly I have a huge network and I'm fully committed to continuing um, to get the message out. Um, we're currently working with uh, Tom and the Sepsis Alliance to add some training material to our state platform that will be available for free to anybody. So again, we can continue to push this out. We will continue to do educational opportunities every month. And then whatever Al tells me I need to do, uh, I certainly am going to do that. <clears throat> so um, I can't thank you guys enough for taking the time, Jillian, Katie, for sharing your stories. We'll make sure that um, all the resources are in the chat box and the, and the, the links to um, Katie's video that we weren't able to show. Tom, I really appreciate all the work that you're doing at the national level, and it's been great to be a, uh, a part of that, even though it, that's uh, new for me. And Al, what can I say? It's uh, always been great partnering um, with you. We are out of time today. I think that this is really important. So for anybody out there, uh, please look at the resources that we put together, educate yourself, your family, your friends. This is not an older adult issue. This is an everybody issue and it has devastating consequences. And I think that we can, we can make a dent in providing that type of education.
Um, next uh, Facebook Live is March. March is our March for Meals campaign where we highlight our nutrition program. We have the largest nutrition program in the country serving over 24 million meals to 300,000 people a year. That was prior to COVID. We've expanded that exponentially during COVID. So I hope you join us for that. And I'm gonna remind everybody to take the COVID-19 checkup. Kelly will put that link again into the chat box. This is the only tool that allows you to assess your risk for contracting COVID, being hospitalized, dying uh, from COVID and uh, spreading it to others. Until we have a supply of vaccines and we have shots in the arm, our number one job is to continue with the safety protocols we've been practicing for the last 11 months um, so that we can continue to slow the spread and not have the devastating uh, you know, consequences that we are all too familiar with from COVID-19. So thank you all for joining us today. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. And again, to this amazing panel, thanks for your time, your expertise and sharing your personal stories. Thank you, Greg. Thank, thank you, Greg. You. Yeah.